welcome students uh, to your first lecture on uh, online video lecture lecturing session this semester um, i will be teaching you refrigeration and air conditioning me 403 um, the, the for third year mechanical engineering batch 2017 and 18 the prerequisite for the course is uh, thermodynamics and fluid mechanics one the textbook for the course the, the CLO, uh, there are three CLOs in this course, uh, in fact it's four, but the fourth one was for practicing of the basic thermodynamic concept to, uh, for refrigeration cycles and then psychometry, psychometric cal calculations and cooling load estimations is CLO3, CLO2 and CLO3 is the air conditioning systems types and applications and the uh, air, air distribution systems or duct design etc. So there is further details um, of CLO ones are here. Refrigeration cycle CLO one is refrigeration cycle uh, and types of refrigerants and application of refrigeration. And uh, um, so those are the CLO one, CLO two, CLO three. So refrigeration by definition is the process of removing heat uh, from a lower temperature region to a higher temperature region. So as you can, as you know, the heat always travels from high temperature to low temperature, but in refrigeration, the reverse how happens because this is based on the reversed Carnot cycle with air conditioning. So uh, with reference to refri uh, refrigeration, we have two devices, two different types of devices. We call it refrigerators and heat pumps. Basically, they are the same device, but the ob their objectives are different. As you can see in this figure here, a, a refrigerator or a vapor compression refrigeration cycle is basically consisting of four devices starting from a compressor, a condenser, an expansion valve and an evaporator. And uh, expansion valve and then we have uh, we have liquid in the vapor condenser and the expansion valve and we have vapor in the evaporator and the compressors it's a two-phase system we also call it it's a two uh, two pressure system one high pressure one low pressure so high pressure is in the condenser and low pressure is in the evaporator um, the, the pressure range is um, like in the condenser it will be somewhere around 800 kilopascal to a thousand kilopascal whereas in the evaporator it will be somewhere around 120 kilopascal 100 to 120 kilopascal so as you can see, it, the, the evaporator, the low side, low side pressure and, and the condenser, the high side pressure, the difference is about 10 times. They are, they are, they are different from each other. So uh, in the refrigerant uh, that we are normally using here is uh, R134 uh, and the, the other ones are R22. Um, uh, normally are R11 are the different types of refrigerant and that we use in a refrigerator or a heat pump. The objective of a refrigerator is to keep a cooler place colder and the objective of a heat pump is to keep a warmer place warmer. So they are different in their objective but they are basically the same equipment. Uh, for example, if, 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 you, if you have a refrigerator, then the freezer box temperature is somewhere around minus 15 to minus 25 degrees centigrade, whereas uh, the kitchen atmosphere where the refrigerator is placed is about 30 degrees centigrade. So what the, uh, the refrigerator cycle is doing is it is absorbing the heat from the freezer box and throwing it into the kitchen atmosphere which is at a high temperature. So it is moving heat from low temperature to high temperature. So in case of, uh, of a heat pump, the example for the heat pump is that of a heated room in a winter season when the weather outside is zero degree or uh, negative uh, temperature outside like minus 10 degree maybe and inside your room you want to be comfortable so your temperature inside the room is uh, 20 22 degrees centigrade so what we are doing that we are extracting heat from the outside winter condition and transferring it to the inside of the room so um, again we are moving the heat in the opposite direction that then it naturally does 
but the objective is different in case of a refrigerator freezer box had to be kept cooler in case of a uh, of the uh, winter season room we want to keep the room cooler so we are transferring heat in opposite direction basically both refrigerator and heat pump are the same device you can use your window ac uh, air conditioner as a, as a refrigerator or as a air conditioner or as a heat pump both at the same time when you when you use it in the right order then it acts as air conditioner a refrigerator is a cyclic device which transfer heat from a low temperature region to high temperature the working fluid used in the refrigerator cycles are called refrigerants QL is the amount of heat which is being removed from the low temperature surrounding or from the low temperature medium TL and QH is the magnitude of heat that is ejected to the warm space at temperature TH and W net in is the net amount of work required by the compressor so this is the input energy that we have to supply in order to move heat from a low temperature to a high temperature medium the efficiency of a refrigerator is expressed in terms of the coefficient of performance denoted by COPR. COPR is somewhat similar to efficiency of a heat engine, but the difference is the efficiency of the heat engine can never be uh, 1 or greater than 1. But uh, in case of a refrigerator or a heat pump, the coefficient of performance can be greater than 1. That is why we don't use um, efficiency the term efficiency for the uh, refrigerator or heat pump we rather use coefficient of performance COP so the by definition COPR that is coefficient of performance for a refrigerator is desired output divided by the required input the desired output here is of course to move heat from the freezer box to the kitchen atmosphere so, so the amount of heat which will be removed from the freezer box is QL from the low temperature medium L denoting low temperature divided by the work required by the compressor W net in and if you do energy balance for a closed system you can prove that uh, the network is equal to QH minus QL you must have done it in your thermodynamics course so you can go and look it up so QL divided by QH minus QL, QL. notice that COPHP is again desired output divided by the required input required input is still the same that is the comp uh, work required by the compressor but the desired output is the QH now we want to transfer heat uh, into the high temperature uh, room so QH so COP uh, of uh, heat pump uh, is equal to COPR plus 1 that is COP of heat pump will always be greater than COP of the refrigerator. Now, as I said in the beginning, the, the refrigerating system is basically based on the Carnot cycle, or we say Carnot reverse cycle. Carnot cycle we study for the heat engine, and then be, because we say it is comprising of two uh, ideal adiabatic process and two isothermal process so it's an ideal process an ideal process can be reversed so when you reverse it the heat engine becomes a, uh, a, a refrigerator refrigerator cycle so Carnot cycle is a, uh, is a completely reversible cycle operating between a constant temperature heat source and heat sink so it's operating between the two temperature limit one is the low temperature we call it heat sink or heat sink and the other one is the high temperature we call it heat source for the reversible process as you can see in the diagram this is the diagram between temperature and the entropy so one to two is the isentropic compression which is normally helping in the compressor two to three is the heat isothermal heat rejection in the condenser and 3 to 4 is the isentropic expansion process in the expansion wall. This is an ideal situation we are discussing. Uh, Carnot cycle here. So in Carnot cycle, 3 to 4, the expansion process is an isentropic process, an ideal process. Okay. And then 4 to 1 is the isothermal heat addition in, in, uh, in the evaporator. So that's the complete cycle 
for um, cargo refrigeration. So th by definition, because it is an ideal cycle, so uh, 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 I, uh, ideal cycle means it is a reversible one. So the amount of heat transferred to the system, and if the same amount of heat transferred back from the system, the system will become again become in the same state without any traces of any change because it's an ideal process. Because of that we consider that the heat transfer to the system and heat transfer out of the system, the ratio of the two heat transfer should be equal to the ratio of the absolute temperature when we are transferring the heat and when we are rejecting the heat from it. So that, um, based because of that reason, we say we can replace what was uh, uh, in, in COP that what we had used um, Q, that is the amount of heat transferred by temperature T. So COP R Carnot will be equal to T L divided by T H minus T L, and COP H P Carnot will be T H divided by T H minus T L. So the denominator is same, just the numerator is changing depending on whether it is a COPR or COPHP. These are the best COP can be achieved by the Carnot cycle only, Carnot refrigeration cycle only. All actual refrigerators and heat pumps operating between these temperature limits have lower coefficients of performance and the reason is obvious because they are considering all the processes to be ideal processes. So they can move forward and come backward without leaving any traces on the system. But the same is not true for in our actual cases. In actual cases when we move forward from one state to another state and when we come back the, the, the state doesn't come back exactly at the same state as it was before. There will be some traces left. So in that case there will be some losses in the actual uh, cases, cases as compared to the ideal case. So that's why we say the Carnot efficiency, the Carnot uh, COP will always be higher than the actual one. High COP, um, our two temperature limit, one is the cold room, one is the atmosphere, 253.15 and 303. These are the two temperature limits that we want to operate. But uh, in, in order to have a heat transfer, we need a temperature difference. So we have to go slightly higher on the high temperature side and slightly lower on the low temperature side so that we can have a heat transfer. Otherwise there will be no heat transfer and then we but that is also restricted by equipment size and cost. As I have been explaining to you in your thermodynamics course, if uh, in case of if you look up the actual um, uh, Carnot cycle here, the heat transfer in the condenser or heat transfer in the evaporator, they are at the constant temperature. The line is horizontal here at the same temperature. As we know it, for heat to transfer from one state to the other state, from one point to the other state, the temperature difference required. Otherwise, there will be no heat transfer. But ideally, it can be. In actual case, it cannot be done. In ideal situation, does it really happen? As I've been giving you examples of uh, condensation and evaporation occurring in the atmosphere, in the in the in the nature. So when you place a, a pot of water in a room, the temperature of the water in the pot and the temperature of the air in the air will be in the room will be the same. But after some time, you see that the pot has emptied, all of its water has evaporated, and while the temperature remains same. So there is a condensation process going on at the same temperature. S similarly, reverse, you can think of it uh, in the morning when, when you see uh, dew formation on the leaves and on the plants, etc., on, on the surfaces. But the temperature basically of the surface and the air surrounding it is about the same. This can happen only when the surfaces are very, very large. In our case, in, in, in case of uh, a refrigerator machine, we cannot have such a large surface. So we need a temperature difference. That is the reason for having a delta T. Carnot efficiency, Carnot cycle performance by using a gas um, refrigerator or gas as the medium in, in our refrigerator and a vapor as the medium as a refrigerant in our refrigerator cycle. So when we use the gas 
as you can see here the two temperature limits are cold room temperature and the atmosphere if you are using the gas we ha the gas has to be compressed or heated up slightly above the atmosphere temperature and then it will be cooled back to the atmospheric temperature so this x amount of energy is the extra amount of energy which is needed similarly so th so the efficiency will be dropping here similarly when we are cooling it down it has to cool below the cold, cold room temperature so that it can absorb some heat from the cold room and then come back to state one come back to the cold room temperature okay so this y area will be another loss temperature limit so in case of a gas also if we, we use a gas as a refrigerant we cannot achieve Carnot efficiency it will be slightly lower than that it will be uh, lower than the uh, Carnot COP if we use a vapor so in this diagram as you can see this is the temperature entropy diagram so 1 to 2 is the compression process in the compressor 2 to 3 is the condensation process in the condenser at a high at a higher pressure and 3 to 4 is the expansion process in the expansion valve or in a turbine you can say that when you are expanding you can expand it through a turbine and 4 to 1 is the uh, heat addition process in, into the um, uh, in, in the evaporator so here I would like you to pay attention on this 1 to 2 process this is a, a mixture state state one is a mixture state here we have uh, refrigerant vapor and refrigerant liquid both saturated vapor and saturated liquid and we are sending it to a compressor as we know compressor can only handle a uh, gas medium it cannot handle liquid medium if you if we let the liquid go into the compressor it will try to it will make it inefficient it will try to erode the compress, uh, compressor pa uh, parts, it will remove uh, the lubricant from the surfaces of the piston and the piston and it will make up, be, uh, become more rough and uh, uh, more heat will be transferred so it will be uh, damaging your compressor. So it's not a good idea to send a mixture into the compressor. So that is one of the problem in this vapor refrigerant system. And the other one is when we are condenser problem is okay when it can condense saturated vapor to the saturated liquid but when the saturated liquid is expanded uh, into the evaporator so during this expansion process we can think of why not place uh, uh, some kind of expansion device that, that can extract some work out of it like you have the steam engine similarly we can put uh, some kind of uh, turbine system here so that can extract the work from this high pressure liquid which is coming down to the low pressure Vapor. vapor but the, the construction and fabrication of such a turbine is more costlier than the energy we save so because of that we don't use a turbine here rather we use a simple expansion valve and does not care about the um, energy that we are losing here so th that's why this is not an isentropic process this is an isenthalpic process it doesn't in actual case right here it is showing as an isentropic process but in actual scenario in actual device it cannot be an isen, uh, isentropic process it will be a irreversible process there will be irreversibility in it and it becomes an isenthalpic process so if you look at uh, the, the theoretically possible but actually it is not possible wet compression can damage the compressor so dry compression is required the uh, now but between process three to four and the economics of the power device which essentially leads to an isenthalpic isenthalpic expansion process again the, the stress is an isenthalpic it is not an isentropic process it is an isenthalpic process so this is a actual uh, refrigerator consisting of the four familiar components of any refrigerating system by any vapor compression system that is a compressor a condenser an expansion valve and an evaporator so process 1 to 2 for a stand is isothermal addition of heat at constant pressure. So you can see the TS diagram and the pH diagram here. We have put the diagrams here. So if you compare the two diagrams, you will see the difference between um, uh, two lines. 
basically two lines you can see clearly the difference the process one to two and the process three to four if you look it up one process one to two in a ts diagram it is a straight vertical line this is the compression process and we consider it to be an ideal ideal process so it's an isentropic compression process so to get a vertical line but here in the ph diagram the constant entropy line is is a curve like this one so this one to two is become a slanted line here the second difference is process three to four three to four is not an isentropic process so in ts diagram it is kind of slanted that is the entropy is increasing it's a irreversible process so entropy will increase three to four but if you look it up in the pH diagram, enthalpy remains same. Enthalpy is constant. It's an isenthalpy process. So 3 to 4 is a vertical line here. So H3 is equal to H4. We will be using it more often than not. So you should always remember. As solving any cyclic problems, as you may know, you may have noticed, you have been told in your earlier courses, that the basic purpose of solving any numerical for a cyclic device is to find out the enthalpy value. Let's move on. Comparison with the Carnot refrigeration cycle, the standard vapor compression refrigeration cycle introdu introduces irreversibilities due to non ice thermal heat rejection. So, so that, that is this one. It is uh, not at a constant temperature, process 2 to 3, and process um, 2 to 3 basically is not an uh, isothermal process anymore. In ideal, it was isothermal. In Carnot cycle, it's an isothermal process, but in actual, this is not an isothermal process. As you can see, it will go from 2 to 2 dash and then to 2 dash to 3 at uh, temperature Tc. And then isenthalpic throttling process 3 to 4. 3 to 4 is no longer an ideal process. In Carnot cycle, this is an ideal process, so it's a vertical line. But in actual, it is a slanted 3 to 4. The entropy has increased. So we have lost this much amount of energy because of that. So that's why the, the, the efficiency or the COP of the actual will always be less than the COP of the Carnot cycle. Consequently, the cooling effect reduces and the work input increases, thus reducing the system's COP. Work will increase because of this increase. The A1 is the increase in the compressor work. Actually, in Carnot cycle, it's just a vertical line from here to here, and then it goes here. Like a, so this is the amount of heat or extra amount of energy that will be required and here you will be losing extra amount of energy because the process is not ideal process. So this is shaded area and this hatched area, A1 and A2, these are the losses in actual cycle as compared to the Carnot cycle. Okay, so moving on. Refrigeration effect is H1 minus H4 from the diagram. As you can know, what is the refrigeration effect? What is the cooling produced? That is H1 minus H4. And if we multiply it with the mass flow rate M dot, we can find out the total refrigerating capacity. M dot is the mass flow rate, M dot into H1 minus H4. And COPR for the refrigerator is a rate of heat transfer QL divided by rate of heat transfer QH minus divided minus uh, rate of heat transfer QL. So M dot and M dot because we say it's an steady flow process. So the amount of mass flowing through the entire refrigerating circuit is same. So M dot and M dot will cancel out. And we will have H1 minus H4 divided by H2 minus H1. The power in kilowatt per kilowatt of refrigeration is the inverse of COPR. This is just a formula, you have to remember it. And refrigerating efficiency is COPR divided by COPR of the car load. If we, if we know the two temperature, the low temperature and the high temperature, relevant refrigerate, refrigerant properties are available in the, either in the tabulated form or the graf graphical form. We have provided you with uh, figure and uh, tables. And uh, booklet yeah, on your on your uh, uh, drive, so you should look into that. There you will find all the equation properties available, either in tabulated or graphical form. Refer to tables and figures in Excel. So a, you should look at that in Excel. It is there for you um, to look between pressure and enthalpy diagram, and it is showing different con uh, properties, constant line. 
so you can see the entropy constant line is curved line like this one and B constant is the line like this one so when you look at these charts you should be able to figure out these lines and you know, which lines is showing what okay. this is the saturation line this is the saturated liquid line this is the saturated vapor line okay and this is the constant temperature this is um, what is the difference between the actual uh, uh, vapor compression cycle and the ideal one so as you can see actual one is so, so the ideal one is starting ideal one is basically the dash line one dash one is the ideal uh, ideal ideal cycle okay so it, it starts from the saturated vapor line and goes to the superheated region and then the, then the refrigerant will be cooled down and come become saturated vapor line and then it will expand okay so that's the actual constant entropy process that's the ideal one in actuality when we will have some superheating b before your vapor enters into the compressor or at the compressor inlet we will have some superheating not exactly a saturated vapor line but it will be slightly into the superheated region so that will be one difference and when you are cooling in the condenser we may get some sub cooling done also so it will not be saturated liquid that we will get it but we will get a slightly sub cooled liquid this happens because of some modification also we make in the refrigerating cycle we place a heat exchanger here also so uh, heat exchanger so that we can take advantage of the um, uh, coolingness which is put, uh, which, which this saturated uh, refrigerant will still have and we want to um, cool down further this saturated liquid uh, so that our efficiency can increase so that the refrigerating capacity can increase so for that purpose we also deploy a heat exchanger between these two points between the uh, uh, liquid coming out from the condenser and the liquid going out from the evaporator we transfer heat between the two so as a result of that we get a slightly heated um, super superheated region at the inlet of the compressor and slightly subcooled uh, uh, liquid at the outlet of the um, condenser. So those are the uh, uh, in the in the evaporator and in the in the evaporator and in the uh, condenser we consider that the pressure will remain same but due to the fraction due to other reasons cycle differs. Additional effects include pressure drops across compressor suction and discharge walls, pressure drops and heat gains in the connecting pipes, piping system. So as you can see um, uh, as you can imagine when uh, any liquid any fluid is traveling in a pipe so after certain traveling certain distance its pressure will drop why because of the um, hindrance produced by the surface of the pipe itself and because of the viscosity of the fluid itself so those two are the factors which will cause which will hinder the flow of the fluid inside the pipe as a result there should be a pressure drop same is true here there will be a pressure drop and we are uh, we are showing you here why did the pressure drop in the evaporator in the condenser in the piping system of the uh, refrigerator the pressure drop in the evaporator in suction line and across the suction valve has a significant effect on system performance it increases specific volume at suction compression ratio and discharge temperature all these effects lead to re reduction possible so this is an example problem i want to go over it with you um, uh, this is a simple straightforward problem uh, in, in this example a plant using r134 that is the refrigerant evaporates at 0 degree centigrade and condenses at 35 degree centigrade the refrigeration capacity of the plant is 352 kilowatt. So this 4 to 1 H1 um, H1 minus H4 multiplied by M is given as 352 kilowatt. 
and it operates on the ideal vapor compression cycle, determine the following the dryness fraction at the entry to the evaporator. So X4 we need to figure out here. Because we know we will know H3 because the temperature of the con condenser is given, we can find out what is H3 from the table. So once we know H3, H4 is known. Once we know H4, we can find out what is the X value. So that's what we will be doing, the dryness fraction at the entry to the evaporator. The refrigeration effect, so that is this effect, H1 minus H4, the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, because we are already given the, uh, the capacity, the refrigeration capacity 352, so we can figure out what is the mass flow rate from this um, H1, M dot, H, M dot H1 minus H4 is equal to 352, that is given, so we can find out what is M dot. The volumetric flow rate at the suction state, uh, the compressor power, the rate of heat rejection at the condenser, and the COP of the plant and its refrigerating efficiency. So those are the things that we need to find out using different equations as we have discussed in the theory above. So H4 is equal to HF plus X HG minus HF or HFT at zero degree centigrade. So H4 we will know from the table, from the property table of R134 in your handout. This is a copy from the same thing, okay? So our pressure, our saturation temperature is given as 35 degrees centigrade. When you look at here, the temperature is either 35 and 36 degrees centigrade. And 35 is not available. So we have to take the average value. Either you interpolate or take the average value. So HF is 200 kilojoule per kilogram and HG is 398.60. So these values, I'm getting it from the, 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 from the same table, but not here, because here zero degree is not shown. I think I might have zero degree somewhere. This is the zero degree there, there you go. The, at zero degree centigrade, HF and HG. So HF, H, and there you go. HF and HG. HF 200 and HG 398 at 0 degree centigrade of the refrigerant. So from the same table, you can see it right there. 0 degree centigrade, C, HF and HG. These are the two values. And this is the entropy at the entrance, okay? So, at T3, 35 degrees centigrade, we are taking average of the pressure, if you look at these two pressures. So we are taking the average, taking the pressure like this. H3 is HF at 35 degrees centigrade. Again, we have to take average of 247.54 and 250.48. So we'll get 249.01, all right, from the table. This is the table for R134 included in your handout. Okay, so you should look for the table for R134. It, you have a table and you have a, a graph also in it, which we call chart. So look at the table, you will see these two values there. Now H4 is equal to H3, therefore in this equation, we'll, in this equation we know everything else, okay, HF is basically H3, okay, so we'll replace all those values and we will find out what is H3 is HF at 35 degrees centigrade, that's what it is. So when we replace it, we can find out what is the X value. So H1 is HG at 0 degree centigrade. At 0 degree centigrade, H1 is HG, HG 398.60, right there. Uh, refrigerating effect is H1 minus H4, so H1 minus H4 will get you 149.59 kilojoules per kilogram, all right. Refrigerating capacity QL is equal to M dot H1 minus H4. QL is given as 352 in your, in your question, so we can find out what is the mass flow rate. So mass flow rate is 2.353 kilogram per second. D is the suction is, suction is inlet to compressor, that is state one. 
where we want what is D, we need to find out. We need to find out the volumetric flow rate at the section state. So at this state, what is the volume flow rate V? So at the section state 1, V is equal to Vg, it's a saturated vapor at uh, 0 degree centigrade. Is that right? Yeah, this is the evaporator, so 0 degree centigrade. The evaporator is at 0 degree centigrade, so 0 degree centigrade. At 0 degree centigrade, Vg is, I haven't shown it here, but you can see in the same table. Uh, the value is 0 0.06931 meter cube per kilogram. So volume flow rate V dot is V1 multiplied by M dot. M dot we already figure out. So V dot, the volumetric flow rate at the inlet of the compressor is 0 0.1631 meter cube per second. Now find out E, what is E? E is the compressor power how much power required by the compressor. So that is H2 minus H1 is the amount of energy required by the compressor multiplied by the M dot, the mass flow rate. So that will give you uh, uh, the compressor power. So how to find out H1 and H2? H1 is fairly easy. You can get the saturated condition. You can look it up the saturated vapor from the table and and take that value at 0 degree centigrade, saturated vapor at 0 degree centigrade, which is 398. So we know that one. But H2 is in the superheated region. So how we will find out H2? For isentropic compression, S2 is equal to S1 is equal to Sg at 0 degree centigrade. So we know that because it is an isentropic process, so the entropy of point 0.1 is equal to entropy at point 0.2. We want to find out what is the enthalpy at point 0.2. We will find out what is the entropy at point 0.1 and we will say, okay, the same is the entropy at point 0.2. And then we will use that one and the temperature that we know here, 35 degrees centigrade, to find out what is the enthalpy. So that's the idea. So and here you go. What we are doing here is uh, we figure out we know the entropy now is this much p2 is equal to p3 0 0.8 8724 p3 is uh, at 35 degrees centigrade we didn't have 35 so we took the average so 0 0.88274 here that's it that's the one we are using here 0 0.88274 the values in superheated table are higher or lower pressures. So if you look up the superheated table, we will not find this pressure there. The pressure is either high or lower. So we need to do an uh, interpolation. So we have in the table, we have a pressure of 1 megapascal or 0 0.8 megapascal. And we have to interpolate a plate between these two to figure out what is the value at 0 0.88. So we will be doing double interpolation and the arrow is showing the value that we are going to use. This is the entropy. Our main entropy is this one. So this will be in the middle of these two. This one will be in the middle in these two. And then we will be using these uh, enthalpy values uh, at these two pressure and then find out what is these enthalpy values at this pressure. Okay, here you go. Here is the idea. First interpolation at, at state, uh, at the uh, pressure 1 megapascal and the second one at pressure 0 0.8 megapascal. So from the table we look it up but for 1 megapascal the, the value is uh, the entropy value is this much and this much and then we have this value for which we don't know the enthalpy and then we have 1.74 at 1 megapascal we are looking at the entropy value of 1.71, 1.74. These two values are in the table, so we've copied the entropy there. And this value is where this is the entropy value that we have. We want to figure out what is the entropy at this one. So this X amount will be interpolated. So we can find out that um, this will be, um, by doing the interpolation, we'll get this value as 424.19. Similarly, for 0 0.8 megapascal, look at the table so find out the entropy before and after our given entropy and the corresponding enthalpies and then find out what is 
using the interpolation formula, find out what is the enthalpy here. <laughs> okay. So now we know the values at 1 and 0.8, we want to find out the uh, value at 0.8874 in our pressure. So we entropy value and enthalpy value at 1 and 8 are copied here. And then at this one we know the entropy is this much, enthalpy we need to figure out. So the enthalpy we figure it out again using the entropy formula. So we will find out here that H2 is equal to 4 to 1.54. Okay, and then once we know what is H2, we can find out what is the compressor work. So compressor work will be 54. Again, what is the entropy equations? As I've been telling you, you can use the slope method or, a, or, or the other methods that we have discussed of, finding out, of doing interpolation, linear interpolation. So I hope you remember. If you don't, then please look and go back to your thermodynamics course and look up there right, on how to do the interpolation, formula for the interpolation. Okay. If you still don't know, I can still help you with that. I will provide you some material on that or your same slide that I have been using it for thermodynamics. I'll provide it to you, you can see it. Again, uh, moving on, so uh, that is alternatively, alternatively, if we, if you don't want to do interpolation, you have to use the chart to find out what is H2. So how to use the chart? Here's, here's, here's the diagram, here's the chart for R134. So here we know that our given entropy, the entropy that we know is 1.72. So this blue, blue line I have drawn approximately at 1.72. And then I have one pressure at 0 degree and one pressure at 35 degree. This is the evaporator line, the red one is the evaporator line and the green line is the condenser line. These are the two pressure lines, okay? Close to the two temperatures, if you can see that. All right. So. I, this is the condenser line, so the constant entropy will cross your condenser pressure. Wherever it con crosses your condenser pressure, that is the that is uh, that is your point two. We want to find out what is the entropy at that point, or what is the enthalpy at that point. So this entropy line is going from here, and it is crossing your condenser temperature, uh, condenser pressure line right here. So we look up what is the enthalpy here so it is between 400 and 450 and you see the number of lines here you divide it equally and then you figure out how much the value will be here so it will be somewhere around 4, 420 425 it looks like in the center but it is slightly less than that so that's how you can use the chart to figure out so we have taken h2 as 421 it's approximately right so you can either do the double interpolation or you can use the chart to figure that out. Okay. Read the value H2 from the chart. Uh, QH is the amount of heat ejected in the condenser, which is H2 minus H3 multiplied by the mass flow rate is 406 COPR uh, QL divided by WC, it is 6.52. And COPR for the car load is TH minus TL. We know the te condenser temperature, we know the evaporator temperature, absolute temperature we use. So zero degree was the temperature of the evaporator and 35 for the uh, uh, condenser plus 273 add 273 to so we will get 7.80 so as you can compare the two COPs the COPR is 6.52 and COPR car note is 7.80 so it should be like that the car note efficient uh, COP should be higher than the actual one so it is so our calculation is correct the refrigeration e efficiency is simply the ratio of the COPR and the COPR car load, which is 83.6%. I hope you understand. If there is any question and queries, you can write it down. Uh, we have the slide number here and everything, so you can tell, ask me on this slide number, and this is the question. So I will try to explain you on our live session or through the um, email, or I probably am going to use the WhatsApp also, so on the WhatsApp. Thank you very much. We will see you again in the next, next lecture. Assalamu alaikum.